Will you pray for me? O oh God, may the words of my lips and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. It was like this. There was a nation, a great country, a kingdom. And the king of that country married a foreign princess, and her name was Jezebel. And she came to the court with her foreign courtiers and her foreign looks and her foreign clothes and her foreign ways and her foreign gods. And it was okay for a while. But then there was a tragedy. There was a great drought and the people were starving and the people did what people always do in moments like that. They asked, why? And Elijah thought he knew. Elijah pointed to the foreigners to all those foreigners in the court there, to Jezebel and all the people she had brought with her, those outsiders, those different looking, different worshiping, different dressing people, and he said, it's their fault. And so the people organized a contest. Jezebel's priests, her co-religionists, the ones who worshiped the way she did, they built a great altar with an offering on it that was to be a burnt offering. And Elijah built a different great altar with an offering on it that was to be a burnt altar. And they said, whichever God consumes that God's offering, that's the real God. And so the foreign priests, Jezebel's priests, they called on their God and called on their God and called on their God and nothing happened. Elijah called on the God of the Israelites and Fire rained from the sky and consumed that entire offering, even though they had doused it in water first. And it could have ended there. It should have ended there. The people would have said, our God, Yahweh, is the real God. Let us worship him. But Elijah did not want it to end there. So he got the people stirred up against those foreigners, and they dragged them out into the desert and killed them. They slew 450 priests that day. And they claimed they were doing it for God. And Jezebel, she was a foreigner, and so that meant she was powerless in some ways, but she was still a queen, and she was mad. You would be mad, too, if somebody killed 450 of your clergy. And she should have stopped there. She should have stopped with being mad and found a way to deal with it. But Jezebel was not perfect. And so she said, Elijah, I'm going to kill you. Which is where we entered the story with today's reading. Elijah got that word that she was after him. And so he ran out into the wilderness, into the desert, to a place where his only shelter was that broom tree. And he lay down to die. And there, he met God. It was like this. There was a great country once upon a time, a great nation, a great republic, not a kingdom, but a republic. And there was war raging all around. The entire world was fighting. It sounded like... It seemed like the headlines in every paper were about this war, but that country was not part of it until one day a neighboring country rained fire down upon the other country in a place called Pearl Harbor. And so that country that had been out of the war entered the war, but it didn't stop there because, you see, the people who had rained fire down upon Pearl Harbor, some of them had moved to that country years before and were raising children and even grandchildren there, were building their lives there on the West Coast. And the people of that country, when they got all worked up about what had happened in Pearl Harbor, they did what people always do when tragedy strikes. They said, why? And they said, how do we keep it from happening again? And they said, we know. We control the Japanese in our borders. Those people, they could look at Italy and they could tell the difference between an Italian and a fascist. 
They looked at Germany. They could tell the difference between a German and a Nazi. They looked at Japan and they said, they are all the same. So we better round them up and drag them out into the desert. And they, called the, they used words for the camps they built there. They used words like detention, internment. But what they were were concentration camps. They rounded them up, 120,000 and more Japanese from the left-hand side of this country, and they put them in those concentration camps. And many of them were Christians. Many of them were members of Japanese congregational churches, churches related to this very congregation. They looked different. A generation or two, they were from a different place, and so in some ways they were foreigners, but they were, many of them, doing everything they could to be just as American as everybody else. Some of those families have been there longer than my family has been here. And yet they rounded them up and they put them in those camps. And the war raged around. And the sound of airplanes falling and bombs falling raged all around but God was not in that sound. The whistle of bombs cutting through the night, the sound of wind in the propellers of planes roared all over the earth, but God was not in the wind. Fire rained down from the sky, but God was not in the fire. But there, out in the desert, in those concentration camps, the people who had little more than a broom tree to sit under, they sat there, and they heard the voice of God. And when finally this country could no longer bear the shame of what it was doing and opened those camps back up and sent the people home, they took that voice of God with them. And when they got home, they went back to their Japanese congregational churches and their Japanese Methodist churches, the churches they had founded all up and down the West Coast, and they took that small, still voice of God and they started to amplify it with their own. They started to demand justice. They didn't do what Jezebel did. They didn't say, we're going to kill you, though you almost couldn't blame them if they had. They demanded justice. They demanded an apology. They demanded reparations. And so the churches organized and they wrote to one another and they got together and then they got together with the California Conference and then the California Conference got together with the entire United Church of Christ until our entire denomination was demanding an apology and reparations. And it took years. It took decades. But in the end, it happened. And every living survivor of one of those camps was given reparation, monetary reparation for what we had done in those days. And the government spent billions of dollars and it is not enough, but it was something. And it happened at least in part because our churches heard that still small voice out in the wilderness and made it loud. Here's what it was like. There was a great nation, a country, a republic. And inside its borders, there were some that seemed like foreigners, like strangers in a strange land. It didn't matter where they had come from, where their parents or their grandparents or they were born. There they were in the midst of this country, and it was just like they were foreigners. And the reason was they were poor. They lived in substandard housing. Shacks that you can barely even imagine living in, or maybe you can imagine because you've been there. Holes in the roof, wind through the walls, plumbing that didn't work, cardboard for wallpaper. And the world didn't understand them, didn't know what to do with them, didn't know how to talk to them, but they sure did blame the poor for a lot that went wrong. And there were some who saw this happening and decided to do what Elijah did, what Moses did, what Jesus did. They decided to head out into the wilderness to see what they could learn. And so they got a big 15-passenger van, and they put a sag wagon on the back. And they went out and bought helmets and bikes, and those shoes, and so much spandex. 
and they suited up and they stood on the pedals there by the sea and they headed into the wilderness. And they went up hills and down hills and the wind streamed past their ears. Some days they spent all day on a flat stretch with a headwind every inch of the way and God was not in that wind. And they rode over gravel that they didn't expect and they rode across railroad tracks that almost turned their tires. They dodged other people's cars and their bikes rumbled all the way like they were in an earthquake, but God was not in the earthquake. And the sun rose like fire and set like fire, but God was not in the fire. But somewhere, just a few miles from the middle of nowhere, the Fuller Center bike adventure riders were listening. And the cicadas along the road and the traffic whizzing by and the sounds of their own bikes and the blood pumping in their ears, somehow all those sounds melded together into something like silence. And they heard the voice of God. And the voice said, when you get to the other ocean, I will bless you and I will send you home and we will all be just about 4,000 miles closer to the kingdom of heaven. If you believe that, say amen.